Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third installment in our series on real learning in the home. I'm Stephanie Weinert, joined by author and homeschool veteran from a very long time, Elizabeth Foss. We're here to celebrate the release of her new edition of the book, Real Learning, called Real Learning Revisited. It is now in print. So the last time we met, it was almost a print and now it is in print. So if you don't have your copy of Real Learning, you can go to Amazon and get it there or elizabethfoss.com. You can find it that way too. But Elizabeth, how are you doing up in Connecticut? <laughs> We're good. Um, it's been, you know, the nice thing about like completely picking up, moving across several states, starting over in a new place, Resetting school is so easy in the sense that everything's new and that true new school year blank slate thing is really happening here. Mm -hmm. um, it's also very sweet because the unexpected blessing of this year was um, we're getting to do, you know, some school with uh, my grandchildren who are, um, let's see, we have a first grader and three preschoolers and a baby. And um, it's really fun for my younger girls who are the ones I have left at home, but who are preteens and teenagers now. They've always been the babies of the family. And um, that dynamic shift and let them be the, the big kids in a big homeschooling setting is super fun for me. It's yeah. Super fun to pull um, some of those favorite picture books out and have people look at them fresh and new. Um, so we've had fun with that. And then we live in a historical village. The house is you know, 260-ish years old. And, um, and our village itself is a learning experience. You know, there are places to go that are pretty special. And we didn't do a lot of that this summer because a lot of them were, a lot of places were closed. Mosquito. Um, and, and they're opening up a little bit. So we get to do that now too. And um, it's just like the, the whole place is kind of coming alive. And, um, and it's been a, a pretty sweet week. I definitely had one of those t typical, oh my gosh, the first day doesn't go well. It wasn't my first day though. My second day was just, a hot mess but um but that's the way it usually goes isn't it the oh, first day like wow i got yeah. this yeah no usually the first couple of days or even the first week is just and we'll talk about that a little bit more but um but my first day was magical and so my second day i got up and i was like this is so awesome this is like everything i ever aspired to and it was a disaster day so um Oh my goodness. I think it's still Coming back to earth, right? Right. But I think that holds true that the, it, it never goes the first day, it's never go as planned. And I think that's kind of part of the plan, you know, in a weird way that um that the you have to have a plan and you want the plan to be carefully thought out, but you want to hold it really loosely. And and the real purpose of those first days um is to tweak the plan right yeah yeah well let's let's dig into that a little bit and talk about the plan and talk about the first week because different from when we did uh our second week we had a little bit of a break here you published your book we both moved into new houses and we're back together but a lot of people have started school right. in the interim and so a lot of the women on this call probably have a lot of different questions than they had a month ago when they were just thinking about homeschooling or getting their books together. Now the rubber has hit the road and the plan is a real thing. And maybe the plan's working well, maybe it's not. So let's talk a little bit about that. You've got some great advice for us tonight. Um, where do you wanna start? Do you wanna talk about lessons or you talk about plan in general? Where do you wanna start? Um you know, I think we can talk about the plan because I think, you know, my girls are getting old enough now that they have their planners and I've watched it with them. I mean, they're not planning their own school by any stretch of the imagination and they're not like planning lessons or looking at broad curriculum goals or anything like that. 
but I see them like rattled a little bit when I say, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do that. And, you know, Katie's like, I just bought five pens and they're in different colors. And that's not the right color for that thing. And I'm like, oh, where did she get that? <laughs> Genetic. <laughs> But the whole idea that we spend so much time and energy and thought into creating this plan for the year, and then, and then we need to step back and make the plan the tool again and not the master. Um, so I think that I think it's important to think think through your plans. I'm a huge like I, somebody asked me, you know, said like, you do a lot of freewheeling. Are you, you know, kind of an unschooler? And I'm totally not. I'm a big planner, but I am a big diverge from the plan planner. So at the core, at the, at the, at the root of the plan, it still stays the way it was, but it will look a lot different than it might have. Um, so let's talk about maybe some things to remember as you plan and some things that I think what I'm hearing from people is, and, and not just people. So now we have, you know, all these names. Are you a homeschooler? Are you an unschooler? Are you a... <laughs> and, and here's one that cracks me up. Somebody said to me the other day, so are you a homeschooler because of COVID or are you a normal homeschooler? And I was like, I don't think anybody's ever called me a normal homeschooler before. Like somehow this is this is normal homeschooling as opposed to you know crisis homeschooling. But taking all of it, you know, I, I know a lot of people who are trying to make a hybrid work. Um, just all of it. There are some some truths that that hold even if you're not even homeschooling. Even if you're just trying to think about how to organize your kids time and energy when they're home so it's some things that I keep in mind when I'm writing that initial plan the plan that I know I'm going to end up diverging from um, I want to I want to keep lessons short and my girls are older you know my youngest is 11 I'm still keeping lessons short for the most part we have um, some access to some really great college resources um, some lectures and I watched their eyes glaze over today um, during an art history lesson that I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, this early in the school year, it's hard to get them to go that whole hour. Um, so short lessons. And for the little, little ones, we're talking 10 minute lessons, 15 minute lessons. If you have some control over that, um, you know, you don't always have control. I have a, uh, um, you don't always have control in a in a hybrid setting but if you have control then keep those lessons really short um i always front load i mean always like now i always front load the most important things to me so so we start our day with bible study um my girls are old enough that they join me at take up and read in the morning for quick 15 minute bible study and we move right from that to I'm using some things from Bishop Barron's Word on Fire Institute with them. And we do that. Um, and then they do math. And it's like a non-negotiable because I have a long and story history of letting children talk me out of doing math. And now I'm older and wiser. So we don't skip it. And we do math. Um, and then... And then just move on from there. So, so I front load with what I know, because that way, you know, if we're at math by 10 o'clock and the day gets derailed, we've already gotten Bible and math done. And, and that's pretty good, you know, and it's only going to get better from there. Um, I, and then the thing, the other thing I think that is really key, um, particularly if you're trying to do a hybrid or if you've introduced some online learning with kids we were doing um, some uh, in your homeschool um, and we are for sure we're using um, resources we have a college art history class that I, I mentioned um, we're using resources from the great courses um, and my girls are doing a, um, a nature study course through um, Cornell 
that um, that has video courses. But the whole idea of if we're going to sit and watch this video lecture, then it's going to be followed by doing something. That tactile, you know, okay, you you did that. Now you're going to draw. You did that. Now you're going to get up and go outside and you know exercise or something tactile. But just as you're planning, try to keep in mind. All right, they just watched the video. Now is a good time to do handwriting or something that's completely away from the screen and a, kind of using a different part of their brain and their body. Um, mm -hmm. And then that whole thing about exercise, um, I try really hard. And I especially, when I had a house full of boys, right now I have three girls left, but when we began, um, we had five boys with one little girl in the middle, that poor little girl. <laughs> Um, but I, you don't want to like put kids in boxes, but oh my goodness, the energy level then was formidable. And there is a big difference when you are trying to school a house full of boys, right? I mm -hmm. mean, the boy mamas, no. That's my life right now. <laughs> it, there is a bit, we were talking about this the other night. I don't remember. We were talking to a neighbor or somebody who was talking about the boys and the girls and and I remember when we were looking for a house when all my boys were little, and I guess Nick had maybe just been born, saying to the realtor, I want one of those floor plans where you can start in the kitchen and run a circuit and end up in the kitchen. And he's like, nobody has asked for this before. But just that sense of perpetual motion. And I just feel like it is critical for your sanity, for their sanity. It is so important, and not just boys. Um, I also have, I have a girl who, one, maybe more than one, but definitely one who really has a hard time focusing. That child needs to be moving. And um, so I think it really helps if you can get some exercise with them or either get them some exercise first thing. And then as you're thinking it through, Put exercise breaks, even if it's a 10 minute, you know, go out and kick the soccer ball back and forth to each other or whatever. Um, but put those exercise breaks between the lessons, burn it off, um, and you'll be more sane than, you know, than if not. And it doesn't mm -hmm. hurt, Mama, to get outside yourself. I think it's mm -hmm. really, really a good idea. And Stephanie, I don't know about you, but. We moved into a house with a beautiful garden that had a lot of weeds. And those weeds are an endless source of, okay, give me 10 minutes. See how many weeds you can put in that wheelbarrow. You know, and yep. I guess we'll be able to move straight from weeds into, okay, all those trees, they lose their, they lose their leaves. Go outside and 10 minutes of raking and everybody back in. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the exercise component, particularly with boys, but really all of them, it's key. It's got to be part of the plan. Intentional. Right. Right. And that's normal too. That's not abnormal when the kids need it and you need it. That's, that's normal and should be expected, especially with boys, but for everybody. Everybody. So yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think the, um, the whole thousand hours outside initiative, I love that so much. You know, I just, it's like, where were you when my kids were little, where somebody was going to be Supporting and encouraging that. I can't encourage that enough. Um, yep. And we're trying. Yep. We're trying to just stay outside as much. Yeah, have a drink of water. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, in these moments, we need to uh, really be cognizant of how healthy outdoors is. You know, it's just. Yep. It's, yep. It's, critical and so I encourage you to make that be part of the plan um, when yep. you're planning um, yep. and then environment you know every time we do this we talk about environment and I don't know whether it's because we both just moved and we're very tuned into the <laughs> idea of what are we creating here and how is it supporting just life in general I mean homeschool but life life you know mm -hmm. environment is is it's really key to things running smoothly um, mm -hmm. I think it's super important not to just yep. not have clutter, you know, not have the visual distraction, yep. not have a lot of stuff to take care of, but then let the things that you see be things that support your mission, which is 
educating your kid. Right. Right. Yep. And for some of us women, I know there's a lot of moms who are homeschooling this year for the first time who might not be used to being home all day. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, I, God made me this way. What I see visually affects everything inside. Yeah. So if I yeah. am looking at visual clutter, my mind, my heart, my brain, everything is cluttered and it's not good. It, it brings me to a point of stress <laughs> and de-stress. Distress. Um, and then that affects everyone around me. So um, that's why I declutter my home at least once every year. I do like a big declutter because I need to have it for my interior piece, but our whole family needs to have it too. Um, so yeah, it's big. There might be toys to pack up and put in the attic for this season. There might be stuff to send to Goodwill this fall just to give yourself some more peace in your environment. So it's definitely a big thing to consider. And I think the whole idea of preparing an environment is, you know, that's a Montessori, um, a Montessori thing, but it's a, it's a every good teacher thing also, mm -hmm. you know, I, nothing messes up the flow of your plan, um, faster than, oh, you need to glue that? Where is the glue? You know, mm -hmm. I know I saw the glue and then, you know, 15 minutes later, you're looking for the glue and now the baby's not occupied and you've just lost everybody. So I think it's really good to think about what you need. Get those supplies, put them where they're accessible, keep them with you, um, give a quick glance at, at what the plan is in the morning and make sure you've got what you need because that'll keep things moving along. Um, mm -hmm. And double for digital, you know, like if you're trying to make this work digitally, nothing's going to mess it up faster than not being able to do the connection or a child who doesn't understand the mute button or whatever it is, just make sure that your tools are working for you. Um, yep. And then you got to plan for the babies and the toddlers that are in the space. And um, when, so I had this weird gap, um, my oldest, there's like almost four years between my oldest and my next one. Um, I had cancer in the middle of that and, and it gave this gap. Um, but what that gap meant was that <clears throat> by the time he was school aged, um, he, he was older than everybody else. And I've, I've kind of always had a big kid, um, at least one big kid to, to, to do a baby and to, to, to kind of help me, um, either watch the baby or play with the baby or, um, and I've always incorporated them in, you know, okay, it's your turn to, to, to play blocks or it's your turn to read a story or whatever. But give some thought to that and, and make sure you're rotating and it's not the same go-to person. Um, I have a kid who really never learned to cook, but she is awesome with babies and children. And, um, and that's because for some reason, she just always got baby duty and never got kitchen duty. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but, but she's awesome with babies and children. Um, but, but the idea of it's, it's not a bad thing, especially if they're doing something purposeful to incorporate, mm -hmm. to, you know, use a big kid to help with a little kid and rotate it through. Um, so I have a question. This isn't on our script, but I've heard from several moms the, the last couple of weeks who are breastfeeding or have a newborn, um, or at least a breastfeeding baby and, and trying to learn how to fit just the whole taking, you know, taking care of the baby in with the schedule of the morning plan. Yeah. Um, do you just want to speak into that a little bit? Cause that can be hard when you're doing that for the first time and you've got all these different ages and you're trying to keep to your homeschool plan, but there's a lot, if you have a baby or a toddler, that plan <laughs> I, I mean, it's a, and, and it's hit or miss. Play. I'm looking, let's see Blair's here. Michaela's here. Yep. Y'all might have to jump in because what I'm going to say first is you forget. Um, and I never thought I would forget, but, um, and I'm reminded a lot because Kristen will come over with Luca and I quickly remember how all encompassing it is to have a baby in arms. Um, my babies lived in um, an ergo or a sling. Um, I was a front pack person. I mean, I remember carrying Sarah around Disney World in a front pack, like front wave. 
I never could really do it well on my back, but um, I held them close, I held them in front, um, and they got a me view of the world. Um, Kristen says the greatest thing she ever learned to do was nurse in an ergo, you know, like that li liberated her life. Um, and I think we do, we, we learn to do that. Um, I had babies who really would not sleep um, like normal people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just even didn't even put up a crib for the last several. Um, they, they wanted to be held when they slept um, or they wanted to sleep on my bed and I didn't leave them alone. So I, I traded out kids a lot. I have kids who um, did a lot of reading, sitting quietly beside a sleeping baby or holding a sleeping baby. Um, but also I think it's the kind of thing I've never had, I've never even tried to have a, okay, at nine o'clock we're gonna do this, and at 9.15 we're gonna do this, and at 10 o'clock we're gonna do this. And this year it actually is sort of working out that way, but it's because I have no baby. Um, I have always just made a list. First we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, and known that there are gonna be interruptions in there, and that thing that maybe I thought we were gonna do at 10, we might do while we sit around the table eating lunch. Um, and, and to be okay to roll with that. Um, the truth is you can't get as much done with a baby. You just can't. And, and so then it becomes, well, what's the important thing and what can you get done with the baby? Um, you can take everybody outside and go for a walk. Nature study is God's gift to mamas with babies. Babies are happy outside usually. You, you, know, you teach your kids early, early how to pack that backpack so that they have their pencils and they have their nature notebooks and um, their snacks because everything's better with snack um, and go outside and learn, you know, to, to really notice things. And um, it's gotten so much easier, y'all. You don't have to carry guidebooks, field guides around everywhere. You can take your phone and there's an app for bird identification and there's an app for plant identification, <laughs> you know, so you travel light or later um but i can't i mean we're gonna do a whole zoom on nature study um and science and uh, but i can't say enough about how it does it all you know if you can go outside and get them to notice things you are cultivating that habit of attention that we talked about um, if you can get them to draw things, kids who draw, that, that skill carries over into so many subject matters. Um, and you're labeling and identifying and you're giving them a vocabulary for the world around them. Um, and you're outside and it's doable with a baby because babies in slings or front packs or backpacks, um, they like to be outside. There's something soothing about that. So for us, often as the weather's good and, and you know, we're in Connecticut now. I've lost my balmy self. <laughs> and I'm nervous about it, but I'm already talking to my neighbors about, like, how do you stay outside? What do I need to, what do I need to get now so that we're ready? Um, you know, tell me about gloves and tell me about boots. And um, I want to be ready because I think that that's so key to our sanity. And we don't even have babies. But um, so I think nature study is a huge thing or getting outside uh, with babies. Um, but flexibility is key and letting the main thing be the main thing. You, you, you have to, they, they need some sort of faith-based something. Um, whatever you've decided that's going to be, whether it's daily scripture or you're going to, um, whatever that is, they need mass every day. They need to read and be read to every day. And we'll talk a little bit later about ways to make that happen. And they need to write something, but that might be writing a grocery list. It might be writing in their nature notebook. Um, it might be writing directions or making a card or something like that when they're really little. And then the big kids, there's always something to write about. Just give me a paragraph about, you know, the movie you watched last weekend or what you hope for this baseball season or whatever. But if you narrow it down to just that, that literal four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion, 
and just get that done somehow in that day, in those newborn days, you've done so much, especially if the books you're choosing to read to them read across the subject spectrum. You'll get it done. It'll be fine. I mm -hmm. promise. Yep. Yep. That's good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about screens and using the screens because this is a big topic, especially this year for a lot of homeschooling families. What are your tips for using screens this semester? So this tricky, year? right? Because we can't mm -hmm. say, oh, we can't use screens because some of these kids are super tethered. Like they have to be in front of the screen when the school has said be in front of the screen. So the first trick, I think, the first tip for sure is um, no screens except the necessary screens until schoolwork and chores are done. Like, so that means the worst thing in the world is a kid playing a video game on the screen before he's expected to sit and do Zoom for school. You know, like we're eliminating those, those unnecessary screens because that screen time is, is important and we want it to be focus time. Um, so I would, I would absolutely <clears throat> make sure they understand that the screen is a tool and we need to use this tool. And it's not a toy. We're not going to use it to play. We're just going to have it as a tool right now. Um, I, again, exercise before and after screen time, get up, wiggle, move, watch their posture, you know, things that we don't think about, but like, we don't want our kids to spend all their time hunched over, you know, remind them to sit up straight and, and screen glasses and all those things to keep them safe. But that's honestly, it's part of their education. Like we need to make them good at using screens as tools, right? So that's that's part of the deal. Um, and I, I would limit screens before bedtime, you know, research shows that it's really not a good idea to be exposed to screens within two hours of bedtime. Um, and, and for us too, um, set a great example, put your phone in another room when you go to bed. Um, and, and just have that time be a, an a, a, a away from screen time. Um, so I, I think, I think it's, we cannot say screens are bad, screens are the enemy, because in a lot of our cases, screens are a necessary way to communicate and educate. Um, but I think it's like everything else, Stephanie, you know, it, it all comes back to intention. What is your intention here? Is your intention to just sit here and veg out and waste time? Um, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with vegging out, but let's let that be intentional vegging out. Um, and let's pick the best thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think screen rules. And I have written out screen rules in our family so that he just points the list and just say, number five, you know, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but so it's laid out and it's clear and we're going to be real serious about it. Um, yeah. that's good. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the unfettered access to a television or, um, or a computer screen someplace where you're not there, even when they're really little, like you just don't want that habit of falling into, Oh, I have time and space to fill. I'm going to sit here in front of the screen. Just don't let it be an option because yep. they'll pick better things. They'll do more imaginative things. Um, but then they'll be fresher when they do come to the screen and they need it. Yep. Yep. That's good. All right. So let's talk about if mom is working from home because this is a scenario for a lot of our new homeschooling families that mom is not only the homeschool teacher, she's also learning how to work from home at the same time. So what are your tips or advice for her? So working from home has so many different definitions. Kind of yes, and it does look so different for every, every single so person. Different. I have worked from home since, my, I came, since I stopped teaching after my first child was born. Um, but that is an entirely different working from home from my friend who was working in an office until last March and now is putting in 18 hour days doing a job that's changed drastically because of this pandemic. And she's doing it from an office that she's carved out basically under the stairs at home. That's a completely different thing. 
Um, I think that you, if you are trying to do <clears throat> a full-time job that you have to do during regular business hours and your children are home because school isn't an option, whether that's their home two or three days a week because of a hybrid or their home every other week or whatever scenario. But if, if you're in that place, <clears throat> you need help. I mean, I don't know the, the practicalities and I don't know everybody's financial situation or who's around, but it, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. You can't do a full-time job during school hours and educate your children um, because it, it just isn't going to work. And that's where we fall into, frankly, <clears throat> people saying, oh, you know, these kids who are staying home, because they can't go to school, therefore they're, they're going to get behind. Well, they are going to get behind if nobody is able to educate their to, to supervise their education, and they are going to get behind if mom has to work and so she has to put them in front of the television. Um, so, if that truly is the last resort, if that's the only thing that you can do, that you need to look at getting help. And if you can't get help because you're doing this all by yourself, first praying for you. And second, you know, back to the basics, hit the basic, basic things, and then do whatever you can to survive. But if you're assuming that it's part-time work um, or work that you can do in the margins. So, you know, when I, during the times that I worked full time, you know, it's been front loading the, the morning before they get up and then the night after they're occupied or asleep or whatever. And then um, during those, those daytime hours where I can't avoid it, um, then let's think about what they can do. Like you have to do a phone call or you have to do a series of phone calls or you just need an hour to get this email out. What can mm -hmm. they do that isn't just mindless babysitting that is gonna actually benefit them and educate them. And, and this isn't just for a mom who's trying to work. It's for a mom who, you know, really would like to get her kitchen clean or would like, like to cook something a little bit different tonight, needs more time in the kitchen or just needs more time to herself. Um, we all have that time where we want a chunk of time for whatever our project is. Um, so I think that that is where it would really behoove you to train your kids to listen to read alouds um, like Audible or um, Overdrive or any of those places that can give you books on audio. Um, because if you can help them become good audio listeners, you're gonna get a lot of literature into them. They're gonna learn a lot about story structure. They're gonna learn a lot of great words. They're going to be exposed to great ideas um, and they're gonna be gainfully um, occupied while you might be doing something else. One of the tricks of getting kids to listen well, and there aren't very many, but one is to tell them that when they're finished listening, you're going to ask them what they heard. Um, they need to know that they're supposed to come away from this knowing something and being able to tell it back to you. And, you know, sometimes I'll say, you know, um, this, this author uses really great words, you know, bonus points if you tell me the great words or just look for great words that you've heard. Or um, if I know the story, I'll say, um, I want to hear all about what Almanzo ate. See how many things you can remember that he ate. This chapter's full of food or whatever. <clears throat> so that's one thing. Make sure they know they have to repeat it. Um, and then the other thing is give them something to do with their hands. So Lego. Playmobil, um, we have peg dolls in, in doll houses, um, drawing, coloring, um, <clears throat> what is that? Is that a rainbow loom? I'm looking at Anne, because I think Anne's doing all the time. <laughs> that, that loom thing where they're making the, <clears throat> the jewelry, Katie was really into it five years ago. Apparently she's hit a resurgence of interest and she's gonna be aging at the end of the month and bought brand new rainbow looms. And, rubber bands are everywhere again so um but they keep their hands occupied and they're doing something while they're listening laundry to fold <clears throat> my kids can fold laundry like nobody's business when they're like listening to a book um that sock basket that has all that you know unmatched socks in it 
fast. <clears throat> and then with older kids, you know, kids who are actually doing chores for you, um, it, that those headphones are a great investment, you know, give them headphones and a book and they can mop floors, they can dust furniture, like all kinds of active things while they're listening and you are so using that time well. Um, and the time that they spend hearing great stories, listening to books, re read well, um, it's gold. Like that is gonna make them good writers without them even realizing it. Um, and it's gonna make them better readers, better conversationalists. They're gonna have better vocabulary. They're gonna understand the world better. They're gonna be more empathetic. So, um, so instead of having them watch TV, train them to listen to books. That would be my biggest tip for getting work done. Yeah, that's great. All right, so what about, um, I know you've been getting questions, I've seen them coming in the comments about the child who's always constantly interrupting you, whether you're teaching someone else or you're trying to train for audiobooks while you're working or whatever it is, what about the child who is constantly demanding your attention? So I have a couple of kids who are super, super verbal and they just, that's how they process the world. They're just gonna tell me everything. Um, and when they're gone for a while and they come back, it's like, whoa, this kid's really a lot. It takes us a couple of days to adjust to the energy level, right? And when they were little, they were the ones who asked all the things all the time. You know, what if the thought came into their head, it came out of their mouths. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work. You know, when you're sitting there trying to teach a nine-year-old long division and there's that four-year-old who's as darling as darling can be, but not now, <laughs> you know? Um, so one trick with that child is to say, look, I'm promising you that every day at whatever time, I'm gonna sit down and you can talk to me face to face and I'm gonna look you in the eye and we're gonna share a cup of tea or whatever. And you can tell me all the things. And then you give them a notebook and you say, don't want you to forget anything, anything you wanted to tell me. So write it down, draw a picture, whatever you need to do so that you can remember during our special time. First, you hope that you don't have too many kids who need this because you're gonna run out of time. <laughs> but, um, but it works like a charm, like for years, you can get them to, this is your time, this is your time. Um, a, a couple of my kids, that time was like first thing in the morning. I had a couple who were super early risers because they learned really young that they got me all to themselves. Um, and this year, like the weirdest things are happening dynamics in our family. Sarah has had me to herself for like two hours, three hours a day for years. And now all of a sudden, um, she has a sister who's decided she cares about hair. And she's getting up like three hours earlier to do her but she's up and she's in our space. And Sarah's like, <laughs> you can just see him working out that dynamic. So I need to figure out another pocket that's just Sarah's, but, um, but it really does work. And the notebook really helps you to be able to, when they come up and they're interrupting and you're just, okay, I need to help him. You go get your notebook, draw me a picture, write it down. Um, it, that works like a charm. It's a great thing. And those one-on-one -on -one days that that time with them um, is really, it's a really sweet time for both of you. So that's there's good. It, yeah. I love it. All right. Okay. And then your last tips and advice for the plan. We're going to talk about writing and math in a minute, but just your last tips yeah. for this plan that we're all making. We're trying to stick to. So, so the big thing about the plan is you expect that the plan is going to fail, but that's not failure. So the plan isn't going to work. It's extremely rare and you're incredibly gifted if it works exactly the way you planned it. But the plan not working is not failure. It's plan development, right? You're developing the plan. And so your job is to be really observant in those first few days and see where the plan works, where it falls down, where's that pocket of time that you didn't really think you'd have, but oh look, there it is, what can I put in it? And I always keep the plan book, which is super loosely called the plan book, um, open and I write notes in it like, um, like, oh, Wednesdays would be a good, you know, circle, like a time slot in there that just seemed to open up. 
so that later I can look at it and say, all right, well, we didn't put everything in our plan this week. I didn't even try, but now here's where I can fit some of those other things in. So think of that plan book as a journal, especially the first three weeks. And, and a lot of people, frankly, journal throughout. Like they use that plan book to write down how things are going, who's progressing, what needs to be done, um, what work. But especially those first three weeks, think of it as a journal where you're just noting what could do different, what, what is working, where you need to plan more time for certain things, um, where you need to work on a transition. All those things will help. So just have a plan, but then turn that plan book into a journal and then look at it again at the end of the week and see how you can tweak the plan for next week and expect it to be a process. You're developing a plan. Right. You write a plan, but you're developing a plan. Right. Right. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about writing. Um, just some, just some thoughts and tips on teaching children to write. So my mom was an English teacher and um, her motto was you only have to write on days that you eat. <laughs> so um, we write every day. Writing is what we do. And my kids um, really think that that's what grown-ups do. Grown-ups write things. They write things either for publication or for production. I wonder why. I wonder why and your kids think that. They live in a household where somebody is always writing something that's either going to be um, published or produced. <laughs> so their sense is, you know, if you're a grown-up, you have car keys and a credit card and a phone and you write things. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. Um, but... It, writing is, is, is so many things. Like it's what we just talked about is listening to good writers um, read aloud. That is writing in so many ways. Like that is teaching so many things about story structure and, and vocabulary and they start to intuit it because it becomes so much a part of them. Um, but when we set about to to do things intentionally, like to have writing lessons. Um, early on, we teach handwriting and we teach spelling through copy work. So you pick um, excellent writing and you have them copy it. So when they're really, really, really little, the goal might just be one perfect letter. Like here's how to make an A, draw me A's on this page, circle your best A, and that's copy work. And then as they get older, it might be one beautifully written sentence. Um, and we move up to, okay, now copy this stanza in this poem. Oh, by the way, maybe you can memorize it. And you just sort of start to incorporate all those things. Um, a lot of children will learn to spell this way. Some children will not learn to spell this way. And it's very much whether or not they have visual memory. Um, some children, when they've started doing copy work and really paying attention to the patterns of letters, like just intuitively, no, that word doesn't look right, and it's not spelled right. Other children are going to have to be straight up taught how to spell, and, um, and you're going to need a spelling program to do it. Um, but a lot of children, I say the vast majority of children, can learn spelling, punctuation, grammar, very much through copy work. Um, and then depending on what you're choosing, they're getting content absorption too. So if they're copying a paragraph about um, the Declaration of Independence, you might be teaching them a paragraph's worth of content about the Declaration of Independence also. So copy work is, is a great way to teach both handwriting and, um, and spelling, a little bit of grammar, a little bit of punctuation. And then narration is how we teach composition. So narration, when they are like under 10, is basically reading them progressively longer passages, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, and just saying, tell me what you heard. Tell me everything you know about what I just read you. And, and slow, again, beginning small, slowly building up, letting them build that oral composition. Because telling a story is writing in the sense that it's oral composition. So let them do that. Um, and then as they get older, at like about the age of 10, I start having them write. And, or I have some kids who 
do it much earlier. You know, I have a couple who thought they were writing novels at seven and, you know, literally put words on paper, lots of words on paper. So, uh, you know, whenever they kind of show that, um, but usually by the time they're 10, we have them start writing narrations. So um, again, working up from give me three sentences written down about what you learned, give me the three most important things you heard, and then working up to much longer um, compositions where you're teaching them, okay, this is a logical place for a paragraph. This is a logical place for, um, for subheadings. Um, okay, now let's build on this and learn to do a little bit of research. And, and those things come in later, but it just slowly builds up. Yep. I have a question for you about the narration. When you have them do it, are you all like around the table and everyone takes a turn for their narration? Or are you like one-on-one -on -one with a child? The, the, I'm having a problem because I had three boys in three years. So they're very close in age and they're very competitive. And if I read a story to them and then we start narration, if the one child says what the next child wanted to say, I mean, we have, we have some bad fights right. um, over and narration and I haven't really figured out how to fix it. You and you, um, you need to separate them some, you know, you just because there's always going to be the kid who doesn't spit it out soon enough or who, um, that competition can play both ways with boys. It can be a really good thing because it spurs them on. Um, but for the kid who starts to feel like he's always last, it can be absolutely demoralizing, debilitating. I watched it happen here with mine, and I have a big age span between, you know, my oldest one at home and my youngest one at home with one in the middle. And um, I can't remember. Oh, it was a Bishop Barron video yesterday where, you know, when it was over, I was like, okay, you know, and I actually was asking some questions and kind of saying, all right, I'll tell you what you think about this. And my 11 year old was obnoxious <laughs> because she was repeating verbatim what she had heard and leaving nothing for the other two to say, where then they were like, what am I doing here? So I think you have to be careful. And, and I think, you know, they also do need to learn how to take turns. They need to learn how to speak in a small group. You know, college is full of small groups. And the kid who's just walking all over everybody to make his point heard is not really anybody's buddy. Um, and my kids have seen that with this class that we're auditing, this college class we're auditing, even in the Zoom chats, there's one kid who's just eager to impress everybody with his voluminous mind and he's annoyed the heck out of everybody and they see it in that group dynamic but i think it's imp that's an important lesson to teach them as you go a lot of times charlotte mason um proponents who do narration will always say start with the youngest child and don't let them as you move up they're not allowed to repeat so that the oldest child has to come up with something that he hasn't heard anybody else say I mean, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's better to just separate them a little bit. And, you know, it yeah. takes you a little more time, but it, it yeah. depending on that dynamic, I mean, this is where it's so important to know your kids, you know? Yeah. You just, there's no one size fits all. And if you have this feeling that this isn't really good right now, there's gotta be a way to break it up and, and do it mm -hmm. a different way. Okay, okay, that's good. All right, so that's teaching, um, that's teaching composition through narration. We talked about uh, oral narration is really oral composition. Um, okay, so then let's talk uh, a little bit about, more about writing, especially as they're getting older. What are your tips as they're kind of getting beyond the elementary age and the oral narration? What are your tips as they're getting older? Well, I think that they need to learn how to polish the paper, right? And they need to learn how to organize a paper. I, um, I think that for most kids, a season of using the Institute for Excellence in Writing, the IEW, um, Andrew Pudua, basic teaching comp composition gets a lot done in terms of teaching them some organizational things and some style techniques. Um, and I've done that with pretty much every one of them, at least some. Um, but I think nothing beats 
sitting down with them and, and showing them how editing works, I'm really lucky because I can pull up a Google Doc that I've asked people to edit, you know, something that I've written, and then I can pull up the margin on the side. Google has a, a suggestion margin where you can see all the editing notes that are done. And I can show them how people that they, they know who are my friends have said, you really need to change this and that shouldn't be there. And um, they can see me get frustrated even. Um, so, I know that we're unique in that, but I think it's important for kids to understand the editing process and and to um, to see it as somebody coming alongside them and helping make them even better and even better understood. Um, so it's a gentle thing, but it's a necessary thing. They need to learn how to let somebody edit them, but also to edit themselves, you know, to go back through and say, is there a more concise way to say this? I'll tell you what, Grammarly is a great tool. If they've got something that's up on Google Docs and they let Grammarly um, point out things like the passive voice or, um, or where a comma needs to be or where a comma should be dropped or sometimes, you know, it's not, it's not always right. Sometimes I'll be like, no, actually, that is the word I want, you know, and I'm arguing with the technology. Um, and sometimes they get it wrong, but not, not often enough that I think it's a big deal. Like, I think you can override it. Um, but it's a, it's a useful tool for them to use because um, when they go to college um, or out in the world, and my husband has routinely edited emails and things that people who work for him have written before they've gone out. Um, editing is just a part of life, so they need to learn it. It is such an important skill to have in yeah. anything that they're going to do. It doesn't matter what it is. It's so, so I, and I, you know, I tell my kids all the time, if you are a strong writer, you have the world on a string. Like If you can write well, you can make it happen, whatever it is. And I really believe that. I really think that that, you know, we need to equip them with really strong writing skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. All right, so we're getting close to being out of time. Do you want to start talking about math or just introduce it? Or do you want to, you want to? <laughs> um, I mean, I think we can talk a little bit, or we can actually, you know what, let's do this. We can talk about math, because I, I don't have a ton to say about math. Mostly I'm just going to say do math every day and don't ever, ever not. And because that's my biggest regret is, you know, uh, getting sidetracked. Um, but let's talk about math just for a few minutes um, at the beginning of next week. And then, um, and then I'd like to, in the book, Science and History, are together and nature study is in with science. I would really love to really dig deep into nature study. So maybe we'll combine math and nature study. Okay. Is that the plan? Yep. Yep. That sounds good. Yep. All right. All right. And okay. we're not moving. <laughs> we're <laughs> expecting any grand storm this week. Either here or there. Don't even speak these things. That you're just no, no, no. <laughs> no, but I'm scared to say. All right, we'll see you next week because, oh my goodness, we we've had hurricanes. Yeah, super storms. We we've had an earthquake both, down here. <laughs> without, we've both been without internet for more than five days. Mm. Uh, we've been without power. Like, yep. two new houses that are actually antiques. <laughs> like a lot of things have happened oh and there's this global pandemic thing going on so i'm afraid to say i'll see you next week but the plan <laughs> we're gonna be here next week. i'm the opposite i'm like oh we're gonna be here no matter what <laughs> we will find a way uh, we're gonna be here next week it's gonna be good and please invite your friends i know that everyone on the call tonight or who's going to be listening to the recording on youtube has probably 5, 10, 25 friends who are starting a new adventure this fall and could use some encouragement. And maybe they don't need to hear the words that Elizabeth and I have to speak, but maybe they just need you and each other in the community of the chat here. And the chat is one of my favorite parts of these Zoom calls because you're getting to know each other, you're helping each other out with answering each other's questions. 
and we need each other, especially when we're not seeing each other in person right now. So please invite some friends whole, to come. That whole idea of acknowledging the need. I'm really seeing that. Yes. You know, I don't know people well here, but I know that when I text somebody, um, particularly that mom who's worked in an office and now is home and is trying so hard to figure so many things out. And when I just text her and acknowledge that it was the second day of school and just say, so how's it going? That sense of camaraderie is something that she's probably not getting it at her job, um, but that you can give her. Um, and I think mm -hmm. if you are a veteran homeschooler and you're used to having your kids around you all day, you have no idea how much innate good wisdom you have to share with people. Um, it's astonishing. This is, this is something I could have never imagined that, that this population of women who have been like teaching our kids at home for a long time, um, that, that we could have a really unique role to play in the crisis of today. It, it, it still, it blows me away. Um, that whole idea of being a normal homeschooler, <laughs> um, you're a, you're really, you're a gift right now. Mm -hmm. Um, just to be able to say, yeah, I know how hard the first yeah. day is. It's always hard. Just, just to have somebody who's done it before say it's always hard makes that person for whom it was really hard feel a lot less alone and a lot less, um, unqualified. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of people are feeling unqualified and they need people who have done it to say, Oh, I felt like that too. And it's going to be okay. And they're going to turn out fine. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're all going to get to where we're going. It's just going to be a little bumpy on the ride. Yep. So don't yep. miss the opportunities to come alongside somebody and do that. Yep. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Well, I hope that you have a wonderful long weekend, holiday weekend. Be safe. And we will see you next Thursday, 9 p.m. I hope y'all will be here. We want to see your faces. We want you to bring a friend or three with you so that we can grow this community and encourage each other as women and sisters in Christ. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. And also, if you don't have Elizabeth's new book, go to Amazon or go to her website and grab your copy and maybe gift one to a friend too, because truly the first version of the book changed my life. It changed our homeschool and blessed us so much and so many others who were able to get the first edition. So yeah. go grab that book, Real Learning Revisited by Elizabeth Foss. It's on Amazon or elizabethfoss.com. Um, it's beautiful. Everybody needs to have it. And probably everybody needs to gift it to a friend too. So do that. We'll have the recording up on YouTube if you want to send it to anyone or want to watch it again. And we'll see you next week. Yep. Bye, y'all. All, All right. Bye. Bye.